This is the April 11 edition of Commodity Week. Welcome to Commodity Week. I am Todd Gleason. Our panelists for the day include Greg Johnson. He's with TotalGrainMarketing.com in Champaign, Illinois. Chip Nellinger of Blue Reef Agri-Marketing. He's in Morton, Illinois. And Mike Zuzalo joins us from GlobalComResearch.com out of Atchison, Kansas. Commodity Week is a production of Illinois Public Media. It's public radio for the farming world. Find us online at willag.org, W-I-L-L-A-G dot O-R-G. Let's get a list of items that we should discuss for the day. We probably can dispense with the WASDE report, maybe CONAB as well, because I'll ask you questions about that. Other than those, Greg Johnson, what's on your mind? Well, kind of related to the uh, CONAB, and it's not CONAB, but it's Argentina, the private uh there's some rumors that the the uh, corn crop in argentina may not be quite as big due to leaf hoppers a uh, uh, relative of the grasshopper and so depending on which estimate you listen to that could be a couple hundred million bushels and you know we may be grasping for straws but that might be something potentially friendly supportive slash bullish in the corn market and that might be something to uh at least uh, get the market's attention. So I think that's worthwhile discussing. Chip Nellinger, Blue Reef Agri Marketing. Anything on your list? Well, I think these outside markets, the dollar in particular, um, uh, you know, which relates to the interest rate environment right now, uh, is something that's affecting our grain markets. Might be stealing a little bit of Mike's uh, thunder here, and it might be on his uh, short list as well. But I, I think the uh, the weather situation. Uh, not only in uh, Russia and Ukraine, but also the Southern Plains, I think should be front and center. I think it's something the wheat market's uh, keeping an eye on as well. And Mike Zuzlo, GlobalComResearch.com. I think just dovetailing with those other two fine gentlemen of the soybeans have been kind of the leader to the downside with the supply demand fundamentals and, and with, you know, more trade tensions between the United States and China wondering if there was any kind of change to that mindset uh, after the WASD numbers came out today. Well, let's start with those WASD numbers. Uh, Why don't you go through them and some of the changes? There weren't very many, uh, in fact. Uh, Can you begin, Mike, with the global figures for me? Yeah, I think that's where the biggest changes were in terms of uh, face value changes. The, The world wheat stocks to use ratios did drop again. We got to a fresh new 10-year low you know we're right up against within a percentage point or so of the lows uh, back in 2014 and 2013 time period todd and we did see the total demand break through 800 million metric tons and so stocks did drop a little bit on the world side of the equation wheat was very close uh, to the average trade guess But I think that the corn and beans uh, being above the average trade guess, at least as far as the Reuters estimates, 2 million, roughly 2 million tons higher uh, in the corn and and roughly uh, half a million to 600,000 tons higher uh, in the soybeans, probably because the USDA did not cut the South American production. And that's really where the top of the envelope issues were, I think, in the trade was was the sub- supply demand going to come in lower in South America to kind of pick up on what Greg said about the smaller private estimates and now official estimates in both countries for corn and beans? Was the USDA going to play ball with that or keep saying the big crop gets bigger? They, they split it between the middle. They, they took down the Argentine corn crop by a million tons and then left everything else alone. So I think that in and of itself left a bitter taste in everybody's mouth as we went into the second half of trade. Would you agree with that, Chip Nellinger? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, uh, just kind of calculating it up here, you have uh, essentially a 550 million bushel difference between uh, the CONAB number for their corn production and the USDA number. And I think that uh, is throwing people a little bit for a loop, like Mike said, Um, about 300 and some million, I think, on the beans between CONAB and the USDA. So people are scratching their heads saying, what what's the reality here? you know, we're trading the U.S. market. Um, it's driven by the USDA numbers. And I think the market's kind of defaulting um, to those numbers. And it, to me, they seem like relative to what's coming out of the Southern Hemisphere as far as private and governmental uh, estimates, uh, the USDA is like way out in left field on it. And so it leaves a little bit of uh, question in the market and, and, the, and no market likes uncertainty. And 
think the path of least resistance, at least for today, was uh, was lower in these markets. On that note, Greg Johnson, USDA earlier this year readjusted last year's soybean crop out of Brazil higher, uh, and clearly that may have been the case. Do you suppose they'll stick to their guns for uh, much longer this year? And is that part of the reason they haven't adjusted uh, that soybean crop size? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, the government has USDA has been lowering the Brazilian crop by a million metric tons each month here for the last couple of months until this month where they kept it unchanged. So that kind of tells me that they think that their number is right. Uh, supposedly, they believe that there was more acres planted, and based on the exports, they feel like they can justify this higher number. And if you remember, last year the same thing happened, and they never did come together. I think USDA ended up five five and a half million metric tons higher than the uh, CONAB number, the final CONAB number. So uh, we keep thinking these numbers will eventually have to come together, but they didn't last year and maybe they won't have to come together again this year. And so then, you know, is CONAB out in left field or is uh, USD out in way out in right field? (laughs) As Chip, Chip put it perfectly, you know, the market does not like uncertainty and there certainly is uncertainty when it comes to which number do you believe in the soybeans. And so, um, you know, the, the market just, you know, until they feel more confident in, in one number or the other, uh, just feels like uh, they just don't want to take a, a position to the long side, uh, you know, un, un, until there's some clarification on which number they want to want to choose to trade. It feels like uh, that lo- that's unlikely to come, uh, at least very early in the new marketing year uh, for soybeans. What are your expectations for how this might play out? My, my expectation is that USDA may be on a track that they want to wait for the 24, 25 numbers next month, and that's when they'll start cutting back in the expectations of the crop. I, I look, and I'm sure the other guys do too, I mean, you look at the stress indexes for drought, you look at the veers, you look at all the um the, the, the satellite imagery and everything you can get from a standpoint of, you know, my South American guy I talk to every other week, he just gave me a fresh crop report last week, and, the, and the, the numbers are pointing down, not up. And I think that's where, if I had to guess, the USDA is too high, and they'll probably come in in May and start to adjust. But at that point, they'll be able to pad the sensitivity of the prices because we'll have fresh 24 25 numbers and and following that through if that's correct with today's 8% increase in US ending stocks for soybeans you know up to 340 million bushels um, that's why I feel like the beans have a, a kind of a weighted uh, look to them as far as I think the corn number could go down more because of strong exports as long as HPAI doesn't get in our in our hair as far as demand from that avian influenza and as I said before about the world weed and what Chip was talking about the Southern Plains, um, it just seems like the grains have a little bit more going for them in terms of both the supply and the demand side at this point. I'd like to close out South America, or at least a portion of South America, and turn to you, Greg Johnson. What do we know about the leafhopper situation, the disease that it has spread in the Argentine corn crop? Uh, the Rosario uh, Exchange clearly believes this to be an issue. Yes, the Rosario Exchange uh, put out a uh, number this morning of 50.5 million metric tons of corn, down from their uh, estimate last month of 57. So that's a six and a half million metric ton. That's over 200 million bushels for those of us that don't speak metric very well. So a 200 million uh, bushel drop uh, hopefully will translate to maybe, uh, a, you know, maybe not 200 million, but uh, 100 million more. Uh, export demand for the U.S. And so we need all the demand we can get. Uh, demand's running around 14.6 here in the U.S. If we could get that up to 14.8, 14.9, uh, that certainly uh, would go a long way towards uh, uh, helping uh, reduce some of the supply of, of the corn crop. But, uh, you know, again, will USDA follow along or will they drag their heels and uh, and reluctantly lower that number? Or is that, is that Rosario number overly optimistic or overly pessimistic, I guess I should say. So uh, just came out, so uh, a lot of time yet before we'll know the, the, the real number, but uh, 
there's some potential there for uh, possibly lowering the Argentine crop substantially, and, and hopefully that translates into some U.S. demand. Now, let's deal with some of the other things that uh, you all are wanting to be asked about. Chip Nellinger, I'm interested to know uh, what you see in the outside markets at this point, particularly, and what's impacting corn, soybeans, and wheat. Yeah, the last couple of uh, rounds of uh, inflation reports, Todd, have come in hotter than expected, both the CPI and the PPI. Uh, We saw the dollar index earlier this week uh, put a real sharp rally in. Uh, To me, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, I'm not so sure, um, you know, exactly what that means for the grain markets. There's different segments of the of commodities and assets. Uh, the energy markets. You've got crude oil north of $85. You've got all-time highs in uh, the gold market. Um, so there is some money flowing into different sectors of commodities um, because of the inflation kind of reignition of inflation. But now with this stronger dollar, I think that's something that uh, directly. Uh, impacts beans uh, maybe negatively. I think that's been um, you know supportive to the Brazilian farmer. Even though our bean prices have moved lower, I think the currency move for them has been a, a net positive. So I think it's a real mixed bag out there. The hope is that it's going to stimulate the funds to get out of their short positions and kind of want to be long grains again. But in the very short run here, I think it's also negative. So I, I think it's something we need to watch. The Federal Reserve has said that they want to lower interest rates up to three times uh, in 2024, that looks less and less realistic. So, you know, I think it remains to be seen, but inflation certainly looks like it's popping its head back up. And will the funds in the long run want to hold this big net short position in the grain markets if we are going into the next stage of increasing inflation is a real question mark out there. Mike Suzlo, I know you watch this on the macroeconomic side. What are your feelings? Well, I, this is one of those markets where, as Chip was talking about, you you have a real reason to feel that maybe the grain markets have some you know real change of trend ahead of them because the gold uh, corn ratio right now, going back to 1974, is the second highest it's ever been on a weekly basis. And so is that telegraphing something? And certainly the retail investor in China, the central banks like China Central Bank, the the investor that has been buying gold has been doing it, I think, for a lack of confidence and also because they believe that there's a lot more inflation out there than the government numbers suggest. They've been right because these numbers this past week showed it uh, as far as the CPI numbers. And so that higher for longer mindset has been proven to be accurate. And and I think it really just goes back to what Chip was talking about. Does this keep the dollar stronger for longer because we're higher inflation, higher interest rates for longer? Or is there a lack of confidence building and all of the commodities will kind of join in then in terms of adding risk premium. So I think it's a lot like the 70s and 80s and maybe even the late 60s, based upon what I've gone back and looked at, Todd, as far as what could be in the works here. And I think we're going to know maybe before the end of planting what these outside forces are going to probably do. Greg Johnson, I want to bring you back to the WASDE report released on Thursday morning uh, and just to the season's average cash price for wheat and corn. It dropped by a nickel each for soybeans uh, by a dime. This is for the crop that farmers own now and harvested last fall or summer, depending on which crop it might be. does that jive with how much grain is in the system, uh, particularly for corn at this point? And do you expect that number to continue to fall? With wheat, I think the number makes perfect sense. Uh, they took it from seven fifteen uh, down to seven dollars and ten cents a bushel, down a nickel. Um, and people were asking me, seven dollar wheat? Don't they know wheat prices are a dollar lower than that? And they said, well, you have to remember this is based on what actually got marketed. So most 90, 90% of the wheat has already been sold. So that number is not going to change very much on the wheat. So fortunately, people sold wheat last summer at relatively high prices. And so that's why that average farm price in wheat is as high as it is. With corn and beans, not quite the same story. Uh, there's probably 50% of the corn still left to sell. Um, so if the price would drop low enough and the farmers sell at those prices, then that could bring that average price down uh, even lower than 470. Yeah. We have the next three months, which traditionally, seasonally are you know, mar- better markets for corn uh, as we have uh, weather uncertainty. 
And so hopefully farmers will be able to take advantage of that and uh, get some corn sold and so that we won't have to see that 470 price uh, drop a whole lot more. But the potential certainly is there. As far as soybeans are concerned, uh, probably 70, 75 percent of the soybeans are sold. Farmers have done a much better job of uh, marketing their soybeans. And so that price probably won't change a whole lot uh, just because the percentage of beans marketed is a lot higher. But uh, it is at 1255. And, you know, theoretically, if we plant a lot of beans and have a good crop, uh, I guess I could see that price dropping further eventually. But uh, this might be low enough for the time being for the next couple of months. And then, Mike, now coming back to you, let's, uh, rather than go to corn or soybeans, still deal with wheat for just a bit. Uh, Chip had suggested the weather in Russia uh, might be a problem. We've talked about that a couple of times during the closing market report with the meteorologist. It has been really dry there. Still, it's spring, and so there's plenty of time uh, for that crop to respond, though uh, that could be an issue. That also would be uh, a problem for Ukraine. And then the southern plains uh, as well uh, seem to be having some issues. What What are you seeing in the wheat market? Yeah, and I think one thing to add to your uh, correct points about Russia is we're also seeing record, historic record flooding, some cases over 100 years more, 100-year uh, highs as far as flooding in the Urals. And, and so some of the key uh, winter wheat acres are also potentially going to bit, uh, potentially get drowned out at this point. So I, I think between the crop conditions surprising me this past week and improving in states like Nebraska and Kansas, and the drought monitor that came out on Thursday afternoon showing less drought in Iowa, even though the seven-day precip in Iowa has been below normal by quite a bit. Um, it, it's it's an interesting dynamic that we're carrying right now. I think we're kind of whistling past the graveyard, assuming things are great. Um, I don't think they are great. Producers in Nebraska and Kansas out in my area are telling me that they're halfway done with beans. They're starting corn this weekend, and they just don't like how dry it is. They love planting in it, but they're getting very, very nervous about the drought potential increasing. And so I think that should be reflected first and foremost in the wheat, Todd. I think that the other thing that happened this week that really needs to be watched is the fact that uh, Russia has physically gone after the energy infrastructure infrastructure and and uh, also the grain infrastructure again near Odessa, uh, one of the big ports. I, my understanding is shut down for at least a couple of days now because of the destruction and the damage done. So I think we've got more reasons to put premium into the market uh, than less, unless we see a spike high in the dollar or unless the avian influenza comes in and really shakes the funds in terms of thinking the demand is going to be really hurt because of poultry and and maybe calling of dairy if uh, APHIS moves in that direction. I'm not predicting that, but um, we just don't know what's going to happen with HPAI and uh, once it now has been found in South Dakota, unfortunately, in a dairy herd um, as of Thursday afternoon. So I I will stay with you. Uh, What do we know about that particular uh, finding? And again, uh, still uh, we're waiting for USDA to do something uh, at this point, I suppose. Yeah, I'm I'm no scientist, but what I can say as an analyst and the other guys, I'd love to hear what they have to say too, weighing in on on the past. When you have these types of, it's like the South America, it's like the uncertainty uh, in the market has to deal with. Right now, the market is taking the path of least resistance, saying it's going to hit our consumption, it's going to hit our demand. Let's take premium out of the market. And so the cattle lows in April feeders, the Friday lows from last week were tested on Thursday. We bounced off those. The the April fat cattle lows were not tested from last Friday. We got within about 20 cents. But those are my numbers to not close below, or we could open this thing up another leg because of the funds. And this is a funds versus fundamentals type market, I think. But for me personally, I, I don't know why we're not mandatorily testing dairy around the country, making it free and finding out where it is and and starting to kind of lock it down. Because at the end of the day, 10 to 15 percent of our dairy slaughter goes into our beef production. And we don't want consumers to think that they can catch uh, HPAI and avian flu uh, from raw meat. And you may think, well, why are you saying that? Well, it's because the the press over in Europe is already starting to talk about it. So we got to put this fire out before it even starts, if you ask me. Chip Nellinger, anything to follow up there? And then I really want to hear what you have to say about uh, weather in Russia, Ukraine, uh, and the southern plains as well. 
Yeah, no, I think um, that was uh, really good what Mike said. And I, and I really do think that it's already uh, kind of hindering the corn market uh, a little bit. Um, you know, we had that uh, what should have been a wildly bullish um, acreage number there at the end of March. You come in after the, the long uh, weekend over Easter, and there was some news over that weekend and, and early that Monday, and, it, and the corn market should have followed through by all rights to the upside, and it just fell apart. And so I, I really think, you know, I'm not saying it's to the extent of a mad cow, but there's an awful lot of people that trade the grains and trade the livestock and cattle markets uh, that remember mad cow very vividly. And uh, when there's that uncertainty that we talked about earlier, it is just get me out. I, I don't know what it means to meet demand, protein demand. I think it helped the hog market out. I think it's hurt the corn market, obviously hurt the cattle market. Um, and it's a real issue and a real concern I have uh, going forward. I think Mike, um, you know, hit hit this um, you know world wheat situation. I don't think it's necessarily um, an immediate issue on the wheat, but like Mike said, you know, you've had some you know record high summer like temperatures um, in some of those main growing areas uh, of Russia and even um, uh, Ukraine. And uh, they got a little bit of rain in the forecast, it looks like, but, you know, probably still a little bit below average. And, and I don't think it's a case where we, um, uh, you know, wave the flag and say the crop's dead. But if they don't start getting some better moisture there and better moisture in uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, I, I think within the next four or five weeks, the wheat market really takes notice and crop conditions should deteriorate. And I think so, that could be something that also – you know, help spur some short covering. If wheat were to rally and and do that, I think that helps the corn market to a certain extent too. So I think there's a lot of, you know, moving gears in here, as we've talked about the weather being one of them. Um, you could be in for some real choppy, volatile, um, you know, trade in the next six or eight weeks that doesn't make a lot of sense and, you know, gets people uh, kind of turned around backwards on this thing. One outside influence, Greg, that I'd like you to take up as well uh, is war across the planet. We've mentioned Ukraine uh, and Russia's targeting of Odessa. Uh, however, Ukraine targeted the infrastructure within Russia, particularly their ability to uh, produce uh, and crack crude oil. Uh, and then you have uh, the Middle East, where uh, they're remains a war in Israel with Hamas. Uh, however, uh, they have involved Iran directly. Iran says they will respond at some point. What kind of, kinds of concerns do we have as it's related to the marketplace? Well, we've seen oil prices uh, trade in the mid to upper 80s. Uh, there's some talk that it could get into the 90s and maybe even touch 100 if, uh, if a war actually does uh, break out or a skirmish breaks out. Um, and that you in the good old days, we would think higher oil prices means higher ethanol prices, which means higher corn prices. The, the problem this time around is um, ethanol is kind of a function of mileage driven. It's more of a demand thing than a price thing. So in other words, oil prices can go higher due to a lack of output and ethanol prices don't necessarily need to follow along, um, you know, because we're only blending 10 percent. Uh, ethanol for every gallon of gasoline we're using. Um, so if crude oil prices go up because of a war, that doesn't necessarily translate into more demand for ethanol. So, um, you know, I think we, we need to be mindful of that. Um, it, it, you know, the, it, it certainly is higher, you know, higher gold prices, higher crude oil prices, but I'm not sure it translates into higher corn prices necessarily. And finally, from each of you, and Mike, I'll start with you before we get our final word here, uh, with marketing of old crop, corn, new crop, uh, as well for corn and soybeans, what should farmers have at the top of their mind? I, I think the top of my mind would be you're still profitable in the soybeans for both old crop and new crop at this, Todd, uh, this time, Todd, whereas the, the corn and wheat, you just really can't get there at this stage. Uh, and so I, I think that's what you start with. And again, the supply demand fundamentals, I think, rule um, when it comes to, you know, making that next move as far as what do I sell first. And just to give you an idea, if we lost, one of the guys was talking about the loss of South American production potentially in corn. If we lost 10 million metric tons off the ending stocks globally, that take us down to a 308 ending stocks for corn. That'd be the lowest in five plus years. So we've been flatlining corn ending stocks for four or five years. It wouldn't take much 
I should say, in stocks to use ratios, it wouldn't take much to change that dynamic very, very quickly. Greg Johnson, your thoughts on marketing? Mike hit it right on the head with soybeans. They're still profitable. I encourage farmers to go through their cost of productions. And if you can make money, I know it's not going to be as much as we've made the previous three years, but uh, you know, those, those years are behind us and we just have to you know, readjust. And if we can make some money in beans, we need to sell some beans and corn. Um, even though old crop corn prices are low, there's still very good carry in the market. New crop be- uh, corn prices uh, have been hanging around 470. Uh, if we could get the seasonal 20 cent rally up to 480, 490, I know everybody wants something with a five in front of it, um, and I'm not sure if 480, 490 futures, which would be like 450, 460 cash, I don't know if that makes money, but I will remind people the market doesn't care if you if farmers make money or not. If they think there's a glut, a, su- a surplus, uh, they're going to run the price down to where you know somebody will either store it or use it. So um, maybe this is a year where we just try to break even on corn, make a little, little bit of money on beans. And, uh, and and kind of go from there. We, we, we don't want to be double long uh, old crop and new crop corn. So hopefully here in the next 90 days, we'll get an opportunity to take advantage of that. Yeah, I think a couple things. I, I think as far as old crop goes, corn and beans both, if you're holding on to uh, some unpriced inventory right now, you got a couple weeks left here, um, you know, but once the planters start rolling, assuming we have, um, you know, normal weather, it, it's hard for the market to go up. So you're at a point where, you just about have to make a decision. Do I want to hold this grain all the way into summer and bet on some sort of volatility with the weather or a hot stretch or, you know, some, some volatility out there, or uh, do I cut that loose and maybe look to reown it on some sort of a paper strategy? I think for, as far as new crop goes, um, you got to have a plan, right? I think there's going to be a lot of volatility ahead of us. Some of it won't make sense because it'll come from these outside markets. It won't always be fundamentally driven and make logical sense. I think if you don't have a plan, you're going to get caught up in that and make horrible decisions. So I, I think now's the time, even though it's busy with Springfield work and planning, to make that plan, uh, use the volatility to try to get yourself in a position, uh, both physical inventory and you know maybe paper, to be right no matter what happens, right? If you make some sales on a rally and the market breaks, look for some re-ownership that makes the market um, – not matter which way it goes, right? You've got the sales and you've got top side open. So that takes some some thought and some effort, uh, but I think it will really pay dividends this year because I think there, there's still going to be a lot of volatility ahead of us in the next few months. Mike Cicillo, a final word from you today. Well, I, as Chip and Greg were talking about, given the record high gold prices and, and you know really nice price action in some of these other commodities, my big question coming into this week was, was either the inflation or the report going to help turn the tide with the funds in in their net short positions and neither apparently are going to do that for us and so now my mindset todd would be global cash markets really rule the analysis as far as the next three weeks if we've got problems in america paranagua upriver argentina should be showing that in corn and beans if we've got problems in russia european wheat markets should start to be showing that relatively quickly and if we've got issues in southeast asia Malaysia palm oil has has been, you know, really having a difficult time as far as the psychology of the market. I think that's these are the biggest factor which could cause the funds now to cover their shorts in the next three weeks, other than some weather market issue here in the States. Chip Nallinger, your final word? Yeah, you know, again, I, I, I dovetail with what uh, what both those guys have, have said. It, it really, um, it, there's going to be strange moves that don't make a lot of sense. And you know, back to my previous uh, comment about having a plan. I think it's it's really important uh, to do that. There's going to be opportunities out there. Also, don't forget about the crop insur- insurance decision we just made uh, about a month ago. Uh, that really plays in with your marketing plan. A lot of people bought up on coverage this year. Um, just keep in mind what that, uh, you know, equates to on your guaranteed revenue. You don't want to be making uh, scared sales, you know, at or below where your guarantee is before we even, um, you know, turn a planter wheel out there. And finally, Greg Johnson from TGM. There's a couple of, I don't want to say bullish things uh, when it comes to the corn market, but but certainly friendly or supportive. Uh, just the seasonality, uh, April, May, June typically is a good time for the markets to rally as there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, weather, we know it's dry out west. Um, you know, that could still come into play. And we know the funds are short. So all those things give me reason to think that we can rally 
20 cents um, from where we are, maybe 25. But can we rally 50 cents? Are we going to have a five in front of these prices? Probably not. The farmers are holding too much corn. We've got a 2 billion bushel carry out. Even with 90 million acres of corn, if we have a trend line yield, that's a production number of 14.8 billion. That's about what demand is. So we really don't reduce the supply with a normal crop. So bottom line is we need a weather problem somewhere to get the to get some of this glut cleaned up. And then and you know that's usually not a good bet. So use small rallies, I think, to take advantage and and get uh, get your marketing uh, plan, uh, get your marketing uh, uh, bushels. Uh, more in line with where we are historically, because uh, we're, we're certainly undersold compared to most years at this point. Commodity Week is a production of Illinois Public Media. It's public radio for the farming world. You may listen to the whole of the program on our website. Just click and play at willag.org, W-I-L-L-A-G dot O-R-G, or subscribe to the Commodity Week podcast in your favorite applications like Apple, Spotify, and you can find it on YouTube now. Check out the Farm Doc Daily YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash at Farm Doc. Our thanks go to our panelists today, including Chip Nellinger of Blue Reef Agri-Marketing, Greg Johnson from TGM Total Grain Marketing, as well as Mike Zuzla, GlobalComResearch.com. I'm Extension's Todd Gleason.